Let us pray. Merciful God, startle us by your presence this morning. Silence in us any voice but your own. Challenge us by your word read and proclaimed and continue to lead us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. For a lawyer in the first century, it's a good sound answer rooted in the understanding of scripture. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Then the lawyer asks a follow-up question to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? To my ears, it sounds like a pretty innocent question, who is my neighbor? But not so to the first century Jewish audience. Amy Jill Levine, a Jewish New Testament scholar at Vanderbilt University, has done thoughtful work reclaiming the Jewish context of the Gospels. According to Levine, Jill Levine, the book of Leviticus is clear that love has to extend beyond a people's own group. Leviticus 19 insists on loving the stranger as well. So to ask, who is my neighbor, is a polite way of asking, who is not my neighbor? Or who does not deserve my love? Or whose lack of food or shelter can I ignore? Or whom can I hate? Unquote. There's nothing innocent about the question that the lawyer asks, right? Not surprising, Jesus does not directly answer it. He does not give a precise definition of what a neighbor is. Instead, as Jesus does, he tells a story. It's a story of a man who is attacked by robbers, left for dead by the side of the road. The form of the story would have been familiar to first century ears. It follows the rule of three. It's a useful structure in telling a story or a joke. There was an Englishman and a Scotsman and an Irishman. Or maybe you've heard the one of a priest, a minister, and a rabbi walk into a bar. Something like that. In the first century, it would have been a priest, a Levite, and an Israelite. Everyone knew that this was how stories were told. They wouldn't have spent any time speculating on why a priest, the priest walking down the road, would walk to the other side and pass this person by or why a Levite, another very faithful person in first century Judaism, would not stop and also cross the road and pass by on the other side. They were waiting. People listening to the story were waiting for the Israelite to arrive and to do the right thing. That's the way the stories always went. Except it's not the Israelite who arrives. It's the Samaritan. So it's hard for us to hear the word the way Jesus' original audience heard it. We associate the word Samaritan with good things, like Good Samaritan Hospital, or we, we associate it with compassion and caring, or good medical care, or somehow we need to shed all of those associations to hear the story anew. The first hearers of this story would have gasped when the Samaritan stepped forward to rescue the fallen man. Samaritans were not considered to be neighbors to the Jews by any definition. Samaritans were outcast in the, in the society, considered to be unclean heretics. Bitter tensions existed between Samaritans and Jews, and, Samaritans, and a Samaritan was the last person expected to come to the aid of a Jewish person on the side of the road outside of Jerusalem. Samaritans and Jews were enemies, pure and simple. When the Samaritan sees the woman in the ditch, he could have very easily walked on the other side of the road and passed by. But he doesn't. And if we think about why Jesus tells the story in this way, perhaps, I wonder, it's because Jesus wants the man, the lawyer in this story, and us to consider that our treatment of our neighbor is critical in measuring how our heart is toward God. 
Let me say that again. That our treatment of our neighbor is critical in measuring our heart toward God. So think about this text as an invitation, one to selfless engagements and the ability to make the sacrifice to slow one's life down, to make others count. That's the defining thing for me in this text this morning. All three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan are coming from somewhere, and they're headed somewhere as well. Two are coming from church. The third, we're not really told where he's coming from, but we know that part of what, wherever the Samaritan is coming from included some of the cultural tensions of the day and how despised he was. They all have people who perhaps they are intimately connected to or deeply concerned. They all have personal agendas, and we know that all three are living in the internal struggle that comes with simply being a human in that sometimes confusing universe. Maybe, too, we read this story in the sometimes confusing universe in which we are living. They all had a reason to pass by. They were not assigned to address these, this man's unfortunate predicament. The story is really to help the teacher of the law who's in conversation with Jesus, the one who wants to inherit eternal life but doesn't want but wants to do it with ease by skipping over his own selfish nature, his prejudice, perhaps. The text certainly is about selfish engagements, but it's also about self, uh, sorry, selfless engagements, but it's also about selfless interactions. To me, the strength of this illustration this morning says Jesus share, that Jesus shares is the Samaritan's overflowing generosity. It's almost like do whatever it takes ethic that this Samaritan has. He makes it about the man in his acts of service, his flooding of his gifts of giving, his wine, his oil, his bandages, his donkey, his money, his time, his care, his pledge, and not to mention the serious investment that he makes. He doesn't search this man to see what possessions he may still have. He doesn't promise the innkeeper that repayment of additional debt will fall on the man once he recovers. He doesn't put a limit on the credit amount, uh, the credit account that he opens with the innkeeper. Instead, the Samaritan says, keep the bill open until I return, and I will pay it then. So it makes me wonder, as someone in a clergy robe and a stole implicated in this passage this morning, would I be the one to walk across and pass this person by on the other side of the road? How much could I have given in my name? Think about yourselves. How much would you have given in your name, your wine? your oil, your bandages, your, your coins, your care, your concern, your time? What would have been your cutoff limit? For your family and friends, all of the above. But what if it was a stranger? Someone who lives down the street. Someone who lives in and around the church and one who can't reciprocate. This Samaritan teaches us that it helps us not to let what happens to us corrupt the nature of God that is inside us. Samaritan is mistreated and maligned and ignored and stepped around. So is that person in the ditch. The culture in which he lives is the, and the way he ensures that he doesn't become like the mistreatment that he endures, is to show others how he wants to be treated. The Samaritan teaches us that the power is not in the possessing, that power is in the giving. The important question may not be, who is my neighbor? But more significant, am I a neighbor? 
The Bible teaches that lo to love our neighbors and to love our enemies, because generally, they are the same person. You might not consider everyone to be a sibling, a brother, a sister, but in fact, they are your neighbor. And Jesus expects us to love our neighbors. The gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to live together, to seek justice and peace. It calls us to love all people, to figure out what that means in being and in action. The Samaritan is willing to cross the lines of race and background to help someone who was taught to avoid and fear. He's our model for a life in these times that are rocked by threat of fear, or hatred, or chaos. And with the rapid pace at which news brings us the events around the, the country and around the world, we have some questions to ask ourselves in this country and as a people of faith. When there's a real threat to women's bodily autonomy and privacy, when black and brown siblings are still confronted with racism on our streets and in our institutions, when xenophobia and hatred and chaos come on full display at grocery stores and in fourth grade classrooms and at Fourth of July parades, Maybe our moral question needs to be, am I a neighbor? When grief and anger and fear paralyze us, we must support one another in prayer and calling on God's abiding love to surround us and empower us through the Holy Spirit to do what it is that we can do to meet the needs of our time. So reflecting on this week's events and previous week's events, I found this prayer again. It keeps resonating for me. And they're words of lament. And sometimes words of lament we offer because other words fail us. As people of faith, we are failing one another and we're failing God, our maker, our mercy, our justice our peace. We pray for each life lost, each family bereaved, each neighbor whose fabric has been violently torn asunder by new laws and bullets and hatred and fear. We pray for ourselves that our hurt and outrage, this yearning for justice will not fade from our minds before our hearts are broken open by your passion your passion for mercy and justice and love. Restore our hope, our heart, our sense of the possibility of wholeness and holiness in your creation. Tend the fires of our rage so they may burn for justice and warm hearts that have grown cold. Make the waters of our tears nourish the waters that, fl that flows through the city of God and that the tree of life that is for the healing of the nations. Jesus says, love our neighbor. More importantly today, am I one?